Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank you for coming to the final Delacorte conversation of the year. Um, we would thought we, we would uh, end with a bang <laughs> um, with uh, David Remnick, editor of The New Yorker, um, author of Pulitzer Prize winning book, Lenin's Tomb, um, a man of varied interests and um, uh, many talents. So, David, I'm going to launch right in. You've been the editor of The New Yorker for almost 20 years. Well, let's not race ahead. Um, longer, longer than Vladimir Putin <laughs> has been uh, in charge of Russia. Yes. Um, what, what, has b what was the hardest moment uh, for you as the editor? Killing dissidents. <laughs> 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 oh, me. That's news. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. Um, the hardest moment? Hmm. Now is not so easy. Figuring out who we should be, how we should be, what to cover day by day when uh, you're in a political situation like this um, is not without complication. I find um, there are human aspects to running any enterprise. I, I don't think it would be any different in a flange factory um, when you have to make moves in terms of who's in and maybe who's not. I find that kind of complicated. But I, I have to say, Keith, that um, I, I don't, this may sound completely disingenuous, but I find journalism um, fun, even in moments of this is something you're not allowed to admit to the general public. You're joining the professional guild, such as it is, so I can let you in on the secret and to those cameras that are for what exactly? I, I don't know. It's a worldwide that, live stream. That, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that some of the more horrifying moments in a journalistic career uh, are, are, are fun. That would be banal and, and horrifying, but, um, but even now, it's, it's, there is a certain the thing I always dreaded in life was waking up in the morning and not knowing why I was doing what I was doing. I, there are plenty of, you know, I didn't want to live a life of quiet desperation or boredom or uh, lostness. And I think if you're involved in uh, a journalistic enterprise that you trust and believe in and can do, and the only limit on your work is your own talent or um, exhaustion, then you were um, very lucky. So, so you came to the New Yorker after um, five years at the Washington Post. So it's it's a, no, it's a very simple thing. It, it, I graduated, and this is probably not a repeatable career in the current environment. It's because it's so radically different. But I went right from school to the Washington Post, which was then in its still in its ascendance. It was, it was um, I was an intern and then s stuck around. And so this, the kind of Watergate glow financially and, and re in terms of reputation was still upon the Washington Post, but they, they were growing. So um, who knew that they'd grow again as they are now? Um, so I stayed at the Washington Post and I did, I started as a night police reporter, which is, um, you know, calling hospitals and police stations and and so on, and seeing what horrible thing had happened overnight or during the, during the night, during the crack epidemic. Um, so there was plenty of horror. To being a sports reporter and a feature writer, and then in 1988, after, I suppose, five or six years, I was sent to Moscow and spent four years living in Moscow in the late 80s and then till the end of 91. And then you wrote uh, Lenin's Tomb. Yes. Um, great book of... Uh, contemporary first draft of history, and it's held up uh, very nicely. Not all so of it. Not the mood. And in, in other words, I, I, that's a uh, it's a book of high optimism, and we are in a nadir of that. I think right now, um, the most interesting thing that I'm grappling with um, as a citizen, as a and, and as a journalist, is that I kind of came of age as a journalist at a moment. Well, in 1970, there were 30 democracies in the world. And by 2000, there were 100. And 
certainly in 1991, was a high water mark of optimism in Russia after a, 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 a thousand years of autocracy of, of, of various kinds. And uh, I look at that book, which was published a few years, a couple of years later, and it was written very much in that spirit. I mean, it ends with a coup that's defeated by the people putting flowers and the, you know, literally in the muskets and 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 carbines of, of the, um, of the of the of soldiers, of of mothers of telling soldiers you can't turn on your own people and the coup is defeated and the KGB goes home as if as if this was going to be the forward motion of history and it's epitomized by Fukuyama and all that stuff. And here we are. Here we are at a moment when, um, I don't care if you're on the left or the right, you have to recognize that the trends are not in that direction in Hungary, in Britain, in the United States, um, in Russia. Uh, let alone China. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a very different feeling. Yeah. Um, and the United States bears some responsibility for it as much, as much as anybody else. OK. We'll get to that. That got to you, didn't uh, it? Um, so, but to go back to this, this uh, happier, more optimistic time, um, how did you go from the Post to the New Yorker? How did you make that transition? Tina Brown asked. What happened was I came back from Moscow, and there's a place on the fancy side of town called the Council of Foreign Relations, and I had a, 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 uh, a stipend to sit in an office and, and do what I wanted and occasionally go to meetings, at, and you know the Chilean finance minister would come and you go to a speech, but mainly I sat up in the attic and wrote a book. Unbelievably happy to do so, and I, assuming that I would, my next job would be the New York car, I couldn't, I wanted to go to the Middle East, but my parents were beginning to um, uh, age and fall apart, and that was not in the offing. Um, so I was going to be the New York correspondent for the Washington Post, um, which is a little bit like being the amphibian correspondent for Reptile Daily. The Washington Post doesn't like New York and pretends it's not the city that I love and, and is, but never mind. I was going to do that. And I got a phone call from Tina Brown, who was about to become, I didn't know it, but she was still the editor of Vanity Fair. And I'd written one piece for Vanity Fair about a, a faith healer, a Russian faith healer named K uh, Kashpirovsky, I think his name was, right? He had magic water and so on. Anyway, um, she took me to lunch. And all she did th throughout the entire lunch was ask me about The New Yorker, for whom I had written one piece. And this kept up for an hour. What's it like? How do they edit pieces? This is the weirdest first date I've ever been on. And I had no idea. So and about a month later, she became the editor of The New Yorker. She clearly knew. And very shortly thereafter, called me up and asked me to come. And I was delighted. And for five years, did whatever the hell I wanted as a, as a writer. It was heaven. Did you find it difficult to go from writing newspaper stories to writing the kind of longer New York? Well, I had written some. I had written magazine pieces while at the Washington Post. Um, how why they let me, I have no idea. Um, but for Esquire and the New York Review of Books, um, which was edited uh, by Barbara Epstein, who died about ten years ago, and Bob Silvers, who died uh, a few weeks ago, and a remarkable. Um, two people, and um, so I'd had some practice. I'd had, and writing a book, um, those chapters, some of those chapters had, had generative um, moments in um, magazines, particularly the New York Review. And, and um, now Tina Brown, in the kind of, when people talk about the New Yorker, they yeah. always say, oh, Tina Brown ruined the New Yorker. That's not, that's no, not true. I think it's bullshit. Yeah. I think it's just completely wrong, and there's an element of s snobbery and sexism and all the rest in it. I think she's different, and I think that uh, the New Yorker had become, to some extent, more admired than read. It was still publishing some great things, but I think she was absolutely 100% right to reassess where they were and to wake it up. Did she publish some things or do some things that maybe went too far in some people's minds, even my own? Yeah. Yeah, but she was. Like what? Well, 
I don't know, they just uh, more of an obsession with some subjects that I don't necessarily share. You know, I, there was probably an over torquing at, at times toward uh, show business. But on the other hand, some of the great pieces in New Yorker under William Shawn and Harold Ross had been about show business. I really think that she deserves enormous credit. She, you know, she hired f people that were of enormous talent. Philip Gurevich, Larissa McFark, I mean, a lot of them. David Ramnett. Well, she was very, she had her, I, as I say, she had her mistakes. <laughs> um, it, the New Yorker had aged. And it, I, I think it was, it, it needed something. Now, what had happened is you had one editor, who, a founding editor who, was, who for 25 years existed, Harold Ross from 1925 to the very early 50s. Then his deputy comes in and he's a kind of genius. William Sean, he's the editor for 30 something years. And then you had this kind of um, genius book editor, Robert Gottlieb, but who's really, journalism was not his thing. I think he spent, as he says in his memoir, spent a tremendous amount of time helping to pick the fiction. My feeling about the fiction is I have a fiction editor who knows a lot more than I do. And I, I, I do a final read, and sometimes if I'm bored with the story, I'll say so, but Poetry and fiction are largely in the hands of the poetry editor and the fiction editor. I, I, you know, I, I think she enlivened the thing. All in all, I think it was a plus, especially in the beginning. It, the, the, it was a burst of uh, energy, controversy, attention. Um, it's a magazine. It's not a religious cult. And I thought that was useful. Um, I was I was reading just uh, yesterday that um, somebody I think George Tro uh, supposedly quit because there was too much OJ coverage, which um, you know given twenty years later we you know we had the two major films that were made about OJ. I mean that's so it was an incredible story, <laughs> right? And yeah. George hadn't written for the magazine in a long time. And there was the myth that somehow Roseanne Barr had edited a co an issue of the magazine. It's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't true. No, that would have been great. <laughs> so I look. I don't mean Ben Brad. Would it kind of would have been yeah. kind of great? Um, you know, I just wonder if 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 I decided Remnick with my more kind of you know V-neck sweater Russia studying image had decided that uh, Dave Chappelle helped edit a copy, would I get a program for that? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think there was some tinge of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. I really do. By the way, by the by, Roseanne Barr did not edit it, an issue of The New Yorker. She, you know, Tina may have made some phone calls to Roseanne Barr and said, who, you know, who do you think's funny out there? Who should we write? That's not editing an issue. That's called kibitzing. Right. Um, Chatting, so coughing. So what was it like to take over uh, in 98, um, this magazine that uh, was revered and worshipped? And Insane. Sorry? It was insane. It was an insane decision. I had never edited anything in my life except for my high school newspaper, which was a terrible high school newspaper, <laughs> edited and written three quarters by me <laughs> at a high school called um, the, 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 the mascot. This is how uh, you know, Jersey High School, not a particularly distinguished one. Nobody was interested in the newspaper except for me. And it was. We were the Pascac Valley Indians, and the newspaper was called the Smoke Signal. I mean, it was just, that was it. That was my it's editing preparation. Did, have, did John Updike or Janet Malcolm? They, they did not. not they did they not were not staff that. writers. Okay, okay, they were not yeah. staff writers. And what happened is Tina Brown decided to leave The New Yorker after, I guess, six years and strike out on her own in partnership with Harvey Weinstein to s start something called Talk Magazine. Um, which in the end was not a big success, but okay, that's, she, she decided to do that. And Cy Newhouse, the owner of the enterprise, didn't have an editor. And, um, and you know, th there wasn't exactly a worldwide search. The job was offered initially to someone else, Michael Kinsley, who had edited Harper's and the New Republic twice, who I would happily have worked for. Uh, and Cy, for whatever reason, rescinded that offer, a, 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 an event shrouded in some mystery, and then he offered it to me. Well, I was actually looking at, I was looking through some old issues, and y you were writing like every week. 
So maybe they, they got to do something. Well, maybe they were, you know, maybe they're like, we got to get David to stop writing so much <laughs> the magazine. and leave some space for <laughs> Keith Gessen when yes, he came yes, along. Yes. Um, so, but were you? I mean, were you nervous? I mean, were you, you? You were like I was like beyond nervous. Like you know, you get nervous. And there are any number of events, you know, you get pulled over by a cop, you're nervous. You, you, any number of, it, this was so beyond nervous, right? I mean, there were editorials about the New Yorker in, in, in the New York Times. The, there was a lot of attention on this. This was announced on the front page of the paper, who was leaving as an editor, who was coming. So it was, I, I, without even noticing, I lost 10 pounds in a few months, which by the way, was great. <laughs> But weird, you know, I was just by sheer, I mean, I, I, I'm a pretty energetic person, and when I was in Moscow, I would get up at 8 and then work till 2 in the morning every day for four years. Because I was just completely, and you're working till 2 or 3 because the deadline here for 6 o'clock was a big time difference. So that allowed uh, like a double work day. I remember reading a biography of Solzhenitsyn that his, the, the way he was able to, um, write Gulag Archipelago is he, he psychologically put two days into one, right? That he would work a full day, two hours sleep, work a full day, two or three, is it, he, anyway, that's how it got done. I'm not that, but by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I have a certain amount of energy. And I, after about six months of this, I was 10 pounds lighter and I, all of a sudden, one weekend just was sick, and didn't I didn't, but I didn't experience it as being nervous. I just knew nothing about how to do this, nothing. And my first, you know, tendency, wrongly, um, was to to write. And I should never have written for the magazine in the first year. That was a huge mistake. But I knew how to do that to some extent. So I would, when in doubt, I'll do that instead of learning from patiently from Henry Finder or Dorothy Wickenden and everybody else there what it means to be an editor. Mm -hmm. So when did you feel like you're like, when did you I'm not quite there yet. Okay, okay, okay. No, I'm not kidding around. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not stupid. I, I, you know, Henry Finder, who edits you, um, is an immensely superior editor to me. So is Daniel Zalewski and any number of people I could, I could name. I, I, especially when it's the, the, the matter of taking a, I mean, editing is an incredibly selfless craft of not taking your, your manuscript, Keith's manuscript, and turning it into something that sounds like David Remnick, but through a, an almost invisible hand making Keith sound like the best possible Keith. I've seen it a million times with my own stuff with Henry or you or any, anybody else. It's an immensely uh, difficult, selfless, um, strange craft, and, gi and given only to a few to be really good at it. So, so you, there's a story is told about Robert Silvers that so and so, Lord so and so, would write a piece about, you know, I don't know, English politics. And Silvers would change, not a single sentence survived in the editing, completely transformed. And Lord so-and-so would get the piece back and he'd say, Bob didn't change a word. Because <laughs> you have in your mind, if you're any kind of writer, some idea of what the thing should be. But you're, you know, you're always failing. And to have somebody to help raise it to that level is, is, is a real gift. So, so as the editor-in-chief with these immensely talented editors who are working for you, um, what is your job exactly? How much of it is business? How much of it is kind my, of strategizing? My job, is, my job is largely yes and no, and let's pursue this and not pursue that. Let's hire her and not him. Um, let's encourage that and not this. And that's on a day-to-day, week-by-week basis and also over the course of time. Yes, I read everything in the magazine. The, the internet is another matter. We can talk about it in a second. But everything that goes in the magazine, I've certainly read. And I walk over to one editor or another and say, you know, what do you think about a little less of this? And how come we haven't touched on that? I, I'm not saying I have nothing to do with these things. Um, 
and not just about my pet interests either. But it's also a matter of, um, it's, it, we come out a lot. We come out a lot and we have plans to take care of it. It has to do with politics, it has to do with cultural coverage. Um, but it's also, you know, I think it is a collaborative place. The, at the New York Review of Books, it was Bob Silvers. He was the godhead, and especially after Barbara died, he was it. And then there was a kind of a level of younger people who might have had some editing to do. I don't know exactly how it worked, but really it, every writer thought they were writing for Bob. You, you know you're writing for Henry. You know that I'm going to read it, but you're right, you, that's what's happening. The, your, your main interaction is with this guy or about seven or eight other people. Um, so there's that going on. There's also, it's also a commercial magazine. It's not the New York Review of Books, and it's certainly not N plus one, right? So N plus one, one hopes it keeps its head above water, but nobody went into N plus one, you know, thinking you're going to kick back, God willing, some millions of dollars to the Newhouse family. Well, we thought that, but it didn't, <laughs> it didn't, <laughs> it didn't happen, work so out. Um, it is a business, and there, I do go to meetings where people say things like, you know, brand opportunities and, and, and so on. Is that, is that, has that been growing? I mean, is it more part of your life than it used to be? Is it kind of going in waves? No, but there, are, no, it doesn't go in waves. It's just a constant giant tsunami that never stops. And, but we have important decisions to make and we have the capacity to make them. So the, 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 do you care about the business at all? Because if you don't, you really should. Um, <laughs> just a, at least a little bit. So the business of The New Yorker has changed 180 degrees in the sense that the old business of a magazine was you, um, you sell it cheap. Subscriptions for The New Yorker were cheap. Fift I, you know, when I was a student, you get one for 15 bucks. 15 bucks, like just a few cents a week. The idea being you get it into my hands and your hands and your hands, and then while you're flipping the pages or God willing reading it, you're seeing the ad for Gordon's Gin and those little watch caps or travel agencies or Bonwit Teller or, whatever, or, or you know, Chevrolet or whatever the hell. And it, I don't think it's a big secret to any of you here that advertising is now in the hands for the most part or it's some huge proportion of Google and Facebook, et cetera. So the advertising pie has shrunk. So, and I would go into meeting after meeting after meeting for years and say, you keep telling me, me and they would all condescend to me because what the hell did I know about business? Right, this is with Condé Nast. Yeah, the, the executives, crowd. people in the kind of circulation department or the finance department. And I'd say, you keep telling me that the New Yorker reader is incredibly loyal, that we have a resubscription, re, people re-up at a rate of 80%, whereas the normal thing in the business is 25%, 30%. And I, this is going to sound terribly cynical, but why don't we test loyalty? It's capitalism. Why don't we sort of raise the price and see how much they really love us? Oh, no, no, it's a science. And it was really only until the financial crisis, coupled with the technological revolution, which had been in motion now for some years, that we were liberated, in a sense, to test that proposition. So you may not like the fact that your subscription to The New Yorker is now $100 a year, but I have to think that if you really like this thing that gives you a great short story, six pieces of journalism, talk of the town, something funny, something beautiful, that that's possibly worth two bucks a week. When this thing was three bucks. And it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Did you did you guys cut down on, on um, direct mail for renewals? Because No, well, you, direct mail, um, and we can talk about direct mail for the next half an hour because it's an incredibly fascinating. <laughs> direct <laughs> mail, you, you want to get out of the business of direct mail because you want people to subscribe online, which is seamless and cheap and Auto flip, flips over every mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. without you exactly knowing it yes, and all yes, that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let's talk more about direct mail. <laughs> <laughs> we already had a direct mail panel, actually. So it's, you had a direct mail panel? We did. We did. We had a direct mail guy. Yeah, Torturing it was awesome. these people. Oh, they, they're practically was, at the summer. It was very popular. We when had is some, school over? In a week. 
Oh, Christ. That's why the chairs are set up outside. Now I got it. Okay. Yes. They start pushing you out, like, really early. Um, so, so By the way, I, the, the, my favorite writer in the history of The New Yorker in nonfiction is A.J. Liebling. Do any, any of you know A.J. Liebling? He's a great writer of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Wrote about Second World War, food, boxing, all kinds of things. And he was at the Columbia Journalism School. His father was a furrier and kind of upper middle class kid from New York and he insisted that his son go to graduate school and pick journalism school. And all A.J. Liebling did at the Columbia School of Journalism is translate French pornography. <laughs> but he turned out great. So no matter what you did here, it's going to be OK. Um, that's very inspiring. Why you would need to translate <laughs> French um, pornography is beyond me. So, yeah, uh, let's something to ponder. Let's talk about the web a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I uh, having observed, uh, you know, the magazines that I used to read were basically Harper's, The Atlantic, The New Republic. Um, You're skipping one. And The New Yorker, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, and uh, about you know six, seven, eight years ago, when they started making decisions about what to do with online, it was very interesting to watch them because, you know, uh, Harper's refused to engage. Completely opted out. Completely opted out. Um, New Republic, I think, f kind of freaked out. You know, it was really challenging the kind of smart aleck sort of thing right. that they did, it combined with their great sort of cultural coverage, right? Um, because people were doing it much faster. It, it, it was a real challenge to their whole setup. Um, and then the Atlantic really went all, all in. in, yes. All in. Um, and the New Yorker kind of did none of those things Let for me, a very I, long time. I, uh -huh. I, you, you have it exactly right. Yeah. You have it exactly right. So the internet arrives. How does Condé Nast react to it? It's not what we do. We make, mainly we make these beautiful magazines, you know, we're less about the way we look, but, but okay, you know, Vogue on the internet 15 years ago, why bother, all this, all this advertising is there, what, what, what's, I saw it, I said, we're faster, we're a weekly magazine, we should at least experiment with this and see what it's about, at a minimum, so I got what, the most minimal investment you can imagine, $50,000, which by Condé Nast standards is, you know, and at first, all we did was have what used to be called, before your time, a companion site, which sounds like somebody comes, walks along with you while you're sick and aging. But what it meant was you took the stuff that you were publishing in the print magazine and you put it online. And you had a kind of crappy look to it. And maybe you had a few extra little doodads and fall balas, but not much. That's what you could get for $50,000. Then the, 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 and, and, and I would have all kinds of conversations with people at native places, like Slate was like an innovative thing because it, 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 it was one of the first, right? And I remember uh, a guy named um, David Plotz coming. I, you know, I would invite, earnestly invite people over to talk to us about the internet, as if we were talking about, you know, Jupiter. <laughs> and David asked the right question. He said, why do you want to have this at all? Now, partly it was a flip thing to say, partly it was the arrogance of the native, you know, telling the old guy, why do you even bother? You don't know what the internet is about. I know what the internet is about because I'm on it. That's all I do. But it was the right question for us to be asking ourselves. It took years to figure out. Because for the New York, the, the answer at the New York Times is simple. They're a news gathering organization, a daily newspaper that needs to be online. Because that technology, you don't even see on the subway anymore. You don't, you don't ever see people with a print newspaper, once in a while a tabloid. I wouldn't dream of bringing uh, the, you know, the Wall Street Journal. It's like bringing a bed sheet onto this. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and the Sunday Times, I still get it, by the way. And the Sunday, if for some atavistic reason, the Sunday Times arrives at my doorstep, and my kids look at it, and it's like somebody shot a dog. <laughs> Right? It's like the guts are spilling out, and it's, it's ridiculous. But it still exists for all the obvious reasons, because you're in this transition period, and they're still deriving a hell of a lot of income from it, and old people like me kind of like it because they think it goes with lox and bagels and coffee. Whatever. There it is. But the activity, the journalism, is much, it's the same thing. The Times Online 
you know, take take away some of the, the bells and whistles, Melissa Clark making a, a veal chop or or some of the extra stuff that you get, but it's basically the same deal. The New Yorker was and is this weekly magazine where Keith Gessen spends three months on a piece about a trial in Moscow and a short story is, you know, is, is over here and then there's this other long reporting piece and the fact checkers have worked on it for a couple of weeks and, 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 and. What the hell does that have to do with speed? What does that have to do with hot takes about um, is the dress gray or blue? Um, et cetera. How do, should we be involved at all? So it took a while for us to figure out what we should be doing and what not. Because with, again, in the New York Times, it's the same wine in this new bottle. We're now producing additional wine. And my insistence is that it be commensurately high quality with the other kind of wine. not. We're making, you know, Lafitte Rothschild over here, and then we've got a little Manischewitz factory over there. So when I when we do adapt well to the web and the stuff that I so Gia Tolentino, for example, somebody we hired um, from Jezebel, and she writes twice a week, which would have given New Yorker writers, most of them, thirty years ago, a heart attack. But I love reading her. And I know that she will also begin to write longer pieces and do both, as do I. And I think some of our political writers like the opportunity to break off and write something short and polemical and smart without drifting off into, you know, hot take land. Do we, is it all successful? Are we there yet? No, I don't think we are. And we had to make decisions about fact checking and editing and all the rest. It's commensurate with the, the speed limit. You know, I feel like it happened. Was it, was it a matter of you finally figured it out? Or was it a matter of you finally had enough ad revenue no. to pay no. for it? No. Or an investment no. from no. Condé Nast? No? It was, you it, had a Eureka? No, it's figuring it out. Figuring Look, it out. Okay. I, here's the thing. Um, what I want to do and be about happily for once in this world is commensurate with, with, with what the market actually, thank God, tells us we should do, which is to be as ambitious and as great as we possibly can. I know in my heart that when we publish a 10,000 word piece on uh, the war in Sudan or Balkan politics, that the readership is not the same as a review of, you know, Kendrick Lamar's latest thing, and that we do a, a, a good, sharp review by whomever we're doing it by. I know that. I'm not dumb. I mean, I, 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 I am dumb, but I'm not that dumb. I know that um, Anthony Lane's hilariously funny review of Fast and Furious 27 is going to get read faster than a seemingly forbidding um, piece about a, uh, you know, what do we have? Mil a, a, the biography of Milos that just came out. Great Polish and then American poet. I get that. But I think our readers, when they subscribe, they want all of that. Not just because of the cheap thing it says about themselves and I'm a member of a club and blah, 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 but because they'll get to it eventually. And that they know that when they do maybe maybe not every week, but some weeks, read something that's deep and mysterious and odd and difficult, that it has the potential of doing something to them that's amazing. And that's why they'll pay $100. I think people want that as part of their nourishment. I think people want things that are true and that are not bullshit. And they somehow know they may know, if they're extra sophisticated, that we have 18 fact checkers and working like mad to get it right, but they somehow know it and appreciate it and are willing to pay. And it's a miracle to have your um, ambitions in line with, not every, look, and we fail all the time, 
but overall, in principle, in line with what you want. Not for 40 million people, not for 200 million people, maybe not even for 5 million people, but for enough to make a go of it. So it's a million point two, right? Is that? Yeah, which gets in the hands of, you know, three times as many people as that, and that's that's not, you know, that's not bad. That's not bad. That's worth going to work for. Um, can you talk about the radio show a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, it seems to take up a fair amount. I mean, you you not do really. it every week, no? I do, but it doesn't. It, it actually does not take up that much time. Okay. Of my time, if it takes three hours a week, it's 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 a lot. I mean, there, there, we have four or five people from WNYC who are in our offices working full time on it. They're doing the hard work. I'm doing an interview. I'm doing the kind of interstitial connect one piece to the next. They're doing the hard we go to maybe go to a meeting, but it, they're doing the hard work. Um, and I, why do we do it at all, you might ask, because it doesn't, you know, doesn't make a suit. It's, first of all, it's fun. It's also the possibility that you or you or you might listen to it and think, oh, oh that's interesting. The New Yorker, I, what's that all about? And then join the larger thing. That, that's, that's the real hope. Not that it's going to, you know, public radio never lined any coffers, but that if we do an intelligent show that seems commensurate with or in line with the, um, the website and the, the print magazine and this, this thing, that it's of a piece with The New Yorker, then I'm, then I'm happy. We did a television show, too, where we, we really weren't in charge, but we were working with people that were. Then it didn't, you know, it, it had 10 episodes on, on Amazon, and it was what I would call a noble uh, experiment. <laughs> okay. I.e., uh, it was not renewed. Because apparently people wanted to watch Transparent more than they wanted to watch mini documentaries taken out of the New Yorker. Who knows? Um, it, so the $100, that's, that's working. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you kind of have to keep making the, the print magazine. I want to keep making the print okay. magazine. But you've, you're committed to it now. You Here's can't what I do see on the subway, and I don't think I'm deluding myself. I see people reading the print magazine. Mm -hmm. Folds I, see really people, I, see, I know the people reading on this. They're, I, think they're, I think, first of all, it's not that hard to operate a print magazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, no, it's nice it's, foldy. It's, yep. you shove it in your bag. There it is. It's, it, it, you don't have to go like that. <laughs> you don't have to learn some special folding technique <laughs> that my father taught me when I was a kid with the New York Times. It's, it's pretty easy to operate. It's a good technology. Yeah, yeah it is a good technology. Yeah, good. The, the next question is, do you think it'll be around in five years? I, I do. Look at books. Look at books. People, I think people uh, who are real book readers use both. And it's quite possible that the more uh, ephemeral books get downloaded much more onto Kindles and et cetera, um, uh, whereas, you know, your copy of uh, War and Peace or the Charterhouse of Parma or Invisible Man is, is um, something that you might want to keep around. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, is it something that you... And I have to gamble on everything. at night worrying about, like, print going out of business? Uh, not nightly. <laughs> <laughs> Not nightly. Not nightly. Um, let's take some questions. But I'm not, look, I'm not blind to the, um, the speed at which everything is changing all the time, all the time, all the time. I also do know it's important to be current, it's important to, to re be reactive, but it's also important not to be uh, swept up with every fad and every seeming truism that comes along. I remember going to early internet meetings and I would go, even then I was the dinosaur at the meeting and everybody else was 25, and you and you and you would tell me no one will ever pay for anything online. That was a truism. And no one will ever read anything long on the internet. That was another truism in, you know, 1993, mm -hmm. four, five. And some of the truisms were true. And who the hell knows? But now, I, you know, the word long form didn't even exist, much less be a website or 15 or, you know, or, or an interview series or a fetish object. <laughs> Hello, David. My Hi. Name, 
Hi, my name is Annette, and Hi. I was wondering, you hired uh, Doreen St. Felix. I did, she starts I, next week. I know, I'm her biggest fan. Um, and so I was wondering, because when I saw her being hired, it was like a very remarkable moment for me, because her pieces are very unique in tone. So I was wondering, is the New Yorker now looking for a stronger tone? And like, what is the vision you have with well, people like Doreen? I, you know, you hire a writer because you like the sound of her or his voice, meaning the sound of her or his intelligence and ambition and pursuit. And I don't think that John Updike had a weak voice or Keith Gessen or um, any number of other people. Doreen has, Doreen does what Doreen does. I didn't hire her to be somebody else. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, you know, there used to be something called a New York story, New Yorker story, thought, and, and it usually, usually had to do with fiction. And I think it had to do with the 40s and the 50s, and there was a kind of bland, suburban, white tone. And I think that was the worst of the fiction. But at the same time, you were publishing all kinds of people um, in terms of voice wasn't very diverse, that's for damn sure. I mean, The New Yorker was really as, as lame as, 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 as almost all on that score. Um, but when it comes to fiction now, when it comes to The New Yorker now and nonfiction, I think that's changed a lot. And certainly didn't begin with Doreen, in all due respect to her. Yeah, and why do you feel that's important to have a diverse voice? With because look, at this, look, you know, look where we are. Mm -hmm. What world do we live in? This should reflect the intelligences and, and experiences the, of the world and the talents. But I will say, I, I'm, what I'm, I'm not doing this so that there's 15% of this or 20% of that. You, you're looking for uh, excitement mm -hmm. in, in the deepest sense. And, you know, and, she, and Doreen is really young. Yeah. So it's all ahead of her. Mm -hmm. She's barely begun. Yeah. She's barely begun. Yeah. So same thing with Gia. Gia Tolentino is, a, she's a grand old woman of 25, I don't know how old, some humiliating number. <laughs> and by the way, people, it, it, used, it never used to be that people were, very rarely did people get um, hired at the New Yorker that young. And, and this is an advantage of the, of the web. It, it's allowed you to take chances on and open the door to people who maybe aren't completely down the road yet because it's shorter, more frequent, muscles get built up, you can experiment a little bit more. Um, the only short thing we have in the print configuration of the magazine is Talk of the Town, which is a very particular little um, craft item. And uh, Doreen did some of those for us. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, although it does seem like the- Glad you approve. I hope, I, I, you know, I think we have the same hopes. Hi. I will. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Annette. Annette what? I'll tell her next week. Thanks. Former right. former N plus one intern, by the way, Doreen. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably why you hired her. Yes. Okay. And by the way, we weren't we were pretty shameless about N plus one. I mean, Elif Batuman published, I don't know, one piece before I got excited. I mean, you know, after reading her about her adventures in, in Russian literature, I mean, you and uh, I mean any number of people from N plus one. Sure. Sure. Anyway. Mm -hmm. You find it where you find it. Um, thank you for coming in this evening, it's great. Delighted to be here. Um, uh, I've heard you're a fast and brilliant writer, but I wonder how do you manage... Where did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> At Ollie, oh, Ollie's closed down. I have been your online editor. Um, <laughs> 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 but I wonder how do you manage so many personalities, particularly when I imagine writers are diverse? They're all incredibly um, easy to get along with and always on time, and they write exactly to length, <laughs> all of them. And they're perfect, each in their own way. Thank you think I'm crazy in front of some camera? I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, look, writing is incredibly difficult. And it, part of writing is you're performing in public. And so the idea that writers have their moments of anxiety or delay or um, any number of other symptoms, it's not shouldn't be surprising. 
any more than it is with a, a, a you know, a Shakespearean actor or um, a musician. And that's the job. Anything that I do is a lot easier than writing, for sure. Hi. You feel like you're testifying in court? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Um, my name is Karen. Hi, Karen. Um, you've spoken a lot about being obsessed. Uh, you've spoken obsessed. A lot about the necessity of being obsessed. That's and true. Being crucial to success. Um, you've talked about long form. You've talked about ambition. Um, but right, and you've also talked about business during this chat. Sure. But I think one of the things currently is that to be obsessed and to aspire and be ambitious about doing long form is right now the financial side, especially yeah. if you're a freelance, is yep, extremely it's difficult. Tough. And I wanted to know, I know that the rates are very different right now, um, even when it comes to freelance right. work, um, not just at The New Yorker, but the places that both of you have mentioned. And for the people in this room who aspire to continue to do magazine work. It's not easy. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just not arguing, I can't, I have no, I, but the, what's the question? It, it's basically in terms of, you, you, you already said it's not easy, but in, in terms of if you, if you want to defy the odds or the challenges currently and aspire to do this kind of work. I mean, in talking to, you know, not just the brand people mm -hmm. who are at Condé, but also the people who are coming to you and talking about how to fund these kinds of projects. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure even your own staff mm -hmm. or the, the people who have not yet gotten to staff like Ben, you know, how, how do you sort of figure out that business? People who've gotten to staff like Ben like, Taub? Yeah, Ben is contributing, is my understanding. He's now a staff writer. Oh. <laughs> um. It can happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, the, well, look, my, when I was starting, as I mentioned before, the advice old people, and I'm now in that position, would give to young people, the position that you're in, has nothing to do with the world now. It would be, you know, go to the, try to get a job at the Bergen Record or the, Altoona Eagle or something and, you know, write 7,000 stories about picnics and school board meetings and then local corruption and then hope the New York Times notices you. And by the way, that was a perfectly legitimate piece of advice followed by and enacted by and fulfilled by any number of people who did that, whether in magazines or newspapers. That, you know, I just mentioned A.J. Liebling, he wrote for a local paper, and then he was at the World Telegram. Joe Mitchell, the same thing. Um, all I can say is this, it is not easy. Luck plays a role, there's no question of that. But what I would highly, highly, highly recommend is that you grab whatever job that you can seize onto that will allow you to do the thing itself so that whatever muscles you do have get bigger and more developed. In other words, I hear all the time at sessions like this, not sessions like this, but at other kinds of venues, I've always wanted to write. I really want to write. And so what, I say, what are you doing? Are you writing anything? No, I'm doing da 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 da. And I understand that. People have to make a living. I had to make a living. I didn't have, you know, one of these situations where I had a trust fund or came to New York and there was some hidden, you know, thing propping up a, a nice life in Brooklyn while I tapped away at a novel. That, that was not my fate. I did get lucky, though, with the Washington Post. I completely, you know, uh, uh, um, copped to that. But there is a new world. There is Slate and BuzzFeed, and, 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 and they may not be perfect in your eyes. They may not be ideal in your eyes, but if you can grab something that forces you to write all the time, and that's what you're doing at least some big chunk of the day, or if you've got some other job and you're working on a book, but you really do get your ass out of bed every, every morning and work on it and not think about it and always want to do it, but really do it, then you're doing what you should be doing. And is it easy? No, it's really hard. It's really hard, and I'm gonna tell you something else. It's not gonna get any easier. You didn't come here to do something easy. You certainly didn't come here to do something rich. 
you're talking with someone who got preposterously lucky twice, one being three times, one getting on the Washington Post, one getting sent to Moscow, and one having this preposterous job. I cop to that completely. But I know this world. And to do this well, it's never going to get easy. If you want easy, I, I don't know what pet the path is. But to do this well, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of effort, tremendous effort and drive and focus. And the people that I get along best with and the people I understand the best, um, and the people that do the best, it, not just where I am, but elsewhere, are people that are obsessed with this kind of work, who, 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 who just don't want, want to do it, but they can't not do it. They can't not do it. Does that help at all? Or does it just bum you out? <laughs> <laughs> you can't decide. It's a little of both. I was offered another job that paid a lot more money. Yeah. And twice. And I'm sitting in a room full of people who know the job that I really want and the, the work that I want to do um, in a room full of my peers. And here you are. And so um, that helps me make my decision, and I thank you for that. Sure, and look, I know that a lot of you here are racking up a big debt because you're here. I'm not being, I, I don't want to be patronizing you. you are, uh, a lot of you who are already here already know what I just said because you've acted on it and you've done this insane thing or you've done an insane thing to your parents or yourself or whatever. <laughs> by racking up this thing in the hopes that you will learn something, and it's not just kind of professional positioning, but that you actually learned something in the last year, and God willing, you did. So I respect that enormously. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, I was wondering, as you define what The New Yorker does do and what it will be, are there things it won't be or things it doesn't do? Um, have you decided in areas you won't go? We, we won't hire Milo, what's his name? <laughs> what is his name again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't really cover it for you, does it? Well, look, I, I, um, there's endless talk about things having a DNA. It's one of the great cliches of our time. It's not in our DNA, it's in our DNA, blah, blah, blah. But I, I get what that means, it, 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 that, that certain institutions have certain kinds of bones, you know, that they build upon. But I also think these things are not, to, to, to mix the metaphor, churches. They can change. Um, and sometimes the, the root of the change can be economic. So in the 19th century, in, in both Russia and England and elsewhere, why did people write novels that were 800 pages long? Do you know why? There, no. So there wasn't television, for one thing, and, and people had this was their entertainment, but there was also a, a serial publication. So Dickens, Dostoevsky, all these people wrote these novels. They handed in chapters, and then you'd read the chapter, and that's how you read, you know, Bleak House. We don't have that. And so novels changed because the times changed. Attention spans changed. Different, different inchoate economic, psychological things form different things. I know in my heart that at one point at the New Yorker, there were these things called first in a four-part series, right? This is way before your time. Keith barely remembers it. I remember it some. And some of those series were spectacular. 80,000 words on psychoanalysis by Janet Malcolm, that, something like that, or, or even more on Alaska by John McPhee, or... or Eichmann in Jerusalem. Eichmann in Jerusalem, which I, of course, have problems with, but nevertheless, all those things. They were called books being published into the New Yorker. Why was it possible? It was possible because there was eight zillion pages of ads and advertisers always need to be next to editorial matter. There, there were 6,000 pages of ads in the New Yorker in 1967. There's under 1,000 now. That's a big, big difference. So that plays its role. Also, book publishers don't want you to publish that much of their book in the New Yorker. They believe, well, they used to believe it's great for the book, now they believe it stinks for the book. They think, the reader will think, I've already read it and not buy the book. 
things you, change. You know, sometimes you you guys do pull out like a take a novel and you pull out the best parts and you kind of jam them together and it does. Well, feel... we did, and, and, and I never know if this is a good thing. So we took so Elif Batuman has a novel called The Idiot, a title she seems to have borrowed from somebody. I have no idea who, and it's and it's wonderful. The tone of the the comic tone of the book is, I, I think, kind of the best thing about it. And but it's not the same experience as the novel. You know, it used to be a classical music station in town called WQXR that still still exists, and they'd say, "Here are the first three minutes of the second movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony." It's kind of not the same thing. So, economics can shape these things too. But I hope that the core of who we are, journalistically, in terms of fiction, I ain't getting rid of fiction. Do I know that some huge, some sizable portion of our audience doesn't read the short stories? I know it. But for the people that read it, it's everything to them. So it's, it, 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 would, it would radically change the identity of the New Yorker in a way I don't want. Thanks. Sure. Hi, uh, you mentioned the ads just now, and one of the things I feel like at least once an issue when I read The New Yorker is I get done a story and the second thing I think is like that was great and the first thing is how the hell did they pay for that? Um, like you Karen did. mentioned Ben. Yeah. And then, well that's what I, I'm Partly you did. Right. And thank you and very so, much by the way. Yeah. So my, you're welcome. Uh, for my <laughs> you sound like a satisfied customer. Um, Two yeah, bucks definitely. a week. Um, but that, like, <laughs> not bad. You want to go for three? <laughs> Let's, like, do you have a job? <laughs> uh, Touche, fair enough. But uh, no, I'm wondering, because you guys do a ton of live events, um, or enough, you know, a, a sizable amount of live events. You have uh, digital subscriptions that I know is a relatively new thing. I'm interested in the breakdown. Like, uh, it's, you know, uh, it, it, the breakdown is this. In the, in the, 20 years ago, or even as recently as 10 years ago, 70 odd percent of the income for the, for the magazine was advertising. Now, a little bit more than half is from sub what we call consumer subscribers. You, you, when we referring to events, we don't do anything the number of events that Atlantic does. We, the, the biggest event we do is, is, is almost the sole remunerative one, which is the New Yorker Festival, which is a weekend-long festival of events. I hope you've been to it. You should go to it. It's kind of wonderful. But that's a complex thing that has to do with sponsorships and ads. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a no small thing, but it's, it's not a decisive thing. It's how not a decisive thing. How does like the digital subscription compare to... Um, they pay pretty most people get the whole thing okay. and we and we and we want you to get both so we make it not impossible but unattractive to just get the digital I'm, if, if I'm being honest yeah and then last quick special sure. uh, how much of the revenue is like what percentage is print advertising now as I said it's less than half but just under half, 40 something percent. And, and is it still much more than digital ad advertising? The, the problem with digital advertising, and the more the merrier, and if any of you are digital advertisers and want to pay for it, you know, thank you. <laughs> but as you well know, um, it's cheaper and more ephemeral. It's just, you know, there's a complex system of CPMs and blah, blah, blah. But, but and almost some enormous proportion of that market is taken up by Google. Facebook. I mean, Google Facebook question is a, for another night, but Thanks. it's very interesting. It's just a euphemism, like challenging. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You don't strike me as someone who's just sort of floated through their career, although I imagine that's possible. No, I'm not a good floater. Um, I suspect I keep that's swimming. the case. What is it that you've been, if anything, most committed to in your work? How do you mean? So for some people, it might be human rights, or yes, the, or see. or truth, or wealth, or what wealth. is it that you know, drives you? <laughs> Perhaps you like got the wrong finance, graduate school. We should be at the you know the business school for right. wealth. Um, well, I, I'm not a you know Keith, our, Keith and I have uh, one common bond is is things Russian. Keith is a you know has it for real, and I have it as a kind of visitor. But I, it it. That's one. I, I'm all over the place. As a writer, I was all over the place. I mean, for, for better or for worse. I mean, right in the, of late, I've uh, written, you know, insofar as I write, which is maybe twice a year, other than, you know, little opinion screeds, 
I've been interested in music, partly as a kind of brain diversion from horror and politics. Um, so I don't know what to make of it. It's, it's, people don't just have one identity or one interest. I'm interested in music, I'm interested in politics, I'm interested in Russia. You know, when I was a much younger guy, I was the boxing correspondent of the Washington Post, which is at this point like being the cricket correspondent of the Washington Post. I mean, you know, just I've been kind of all over the place. I hope I'm committed to the nobler things that you refer to, but I'd be embarrassed to say so because it sounds so pompous. But I hope that's part of the picture. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, could I ask you to talk a little bit about how you see uh, economic and kind of business related stories in The New Yorker? Well, we just, um, depends what you mean by business. If business means, uh, you know, endless pieces about Goldman Sachs, there are places that you probably see that with more frequency. I've just hired two people that are, have a business background, Adam Davidson and Sheila Kolhatkar. Um, one from Bloomberg, and in fact, for about a year and a half, she was at a hedge fund. I, I have no idea why she left. It seems like an act of insanity, but hedge fund journalism, but whatever. We benefit by her mental illness. And, and Adam Davidson writes writ more about economics as such. His last piece was this piece about Trump in Azerbaijan. So to me, that's a business piece. I mean, it showed that basically the President of the United States was in the money laundering business. That to me is something we should be covering. Um, and business, the New Yorker was a little bit snobby about business back in the day. You know, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, writing about business smacked of trade. It just somehow, there wasn't much of it. They really, uh, it's very weird a kind of cultural aversion from it, as if to write about banks or, you know, the, the economic engine of the world was somehow unpleasant. I think it's a necessity, whether it's about, you know, Amazon becoming retail, the entire universe of retail, or uh, political corruption, or, you know, politics and banking. I, I think these are essential subjects. They affect your life. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Um, I would like to know, um, you know, if an annual subscription at the New Yorker costs about a hundred dollars mm -hmm. a year. I can get it to you for ninety nine. <laughs> sure. I got a deal for you. That would be like a zero point one percent discount. Yeah, and it would be a great deal. <laughs> well, I wanted to know, you know, how much do you think people are going to be kind of willing to pay up as you know reader revenue becomes an increasingly important part of um, important part of uh, monetization for all sorts of uh, media from I magazines. don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I really don't know the answer to that question. I, I you know naturally I mean I, I didn't take that much economics but there's a you know there's a curve right mm -hmm. and if I start making it too expensive I'm gonna lose first of all I'm gonna use, lose younger people who I want to addict. Mm -hmm. I want it, I want you on board because I don't want you to subscribe for a year. I, I, it's wonderful when older people come up to me and they tell me, you know, I've been subscribing to The New Yorker since, you know, for 45 years and 60 years. That's fantastic. But, but you're like, but you're gonna die soon, you know? And <laughs> Keith, Keith, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. We're all gonna die, okay, okay. Huh. all of us, except maybe me because of pomegranate juice. And ex and daily exercise, but I, I so you, you will find where that is, and uh, you know I don't want, you know I, I want uh, the business to be healthy, but I also want a lot of readers, and I want, and I don't want it to be you know um, a Prada handbag either, mm -hmm. you know, so that eight people can afford it, and it's a kind of fetish object. I'd, I'd like an audience. I want a journalistic influence. I want people reading. Look, the New Yorker is a, is a strange animal. It is a commercial magazine that has 5,000 word pieces about Joseph Brodsky in it. What the hell is that? With cartoons flecked around a long piece about the, a, a war in the Middle East. It's a very strange animal. And if it doesn't watch it sometimes, it's a self-regarding animal too. I, I, I get all that because it's been around, successful, da, da, da. So it, it, it has to, um, well, 
We'll, fi we'll figure it out. Right yeah. now, it's mm -hmm. 100 bucks. Thank you. For you, 99. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, I guess this is not kind of a magazine industry question. It's more kind of on the French pornography side of things. But um, it's on the pornography on the side French of things. French, French pornography. French pornography yeah. side of things. You, uh, Do tell. <laughs> the you've written. Uh, including I've written no French pornography. No, it's true. Um, editorial about um, the Trump 100 days from last week. There's been a lot of coverage of, of kind of the right and where that's going. But it seems that internationally there's a really important kind of like shift in the way politics is done on the left. And just this week we've got, uh, you know, a French leftist candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon who's refusing to endorse mm -hmm. effectively, uh, you know, a candidate who is the the one who isn't the fascist, even though people like Mélenchon go around trumpeting their anti-fascist credentials the whole time. And we've got Jeremy Corbyn in my country and Bernie Sanders here. So, you know, wh where do you think... Well, we've written about Corbyn. We've written about Sanders pretty extensively. Yeah, and, and uh, Mélenchon to some extent in the piece you did this yeah, week. Yeah, but, but you're right, not much. He he's hasn't gotten, the, as they say, the full profile treatment. He's not going to win either. So, I mean, he's a factor rather than a... Uh -huh. But he's a factor to take seriously. And Yeah. But where do you, I mean, where do you think the left is going internationally. Oh God. Is, is it a kind of similar? Is it a That's similar not like French pornography at all. That's a similar you've question. lied uh, to us. <laughs> says you, Keith. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think we take these this seriously. I mean, I, look, I'm, it, my job is not to always be a political prognosticator. I mean, the most important thing is to make sure we're writing about this. You know, on the radio show, we just had Elizabeth Warren on, and we've profiled her, and Bernie Sanders, and I, you know, I, I think uh, some of our columnists have gotten hit between the eyes because not, not sufficient attention to Bernie Sanders, all the crit critiques that you know all that well, but take, the, I don't think the general audience thinks that the New Yorker is um, ignoring the left. I, I don't think. <laughs> I, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, to no, say No, 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 I know you're not, and, um, and we, you know, and I also think we should be writing about the right, mm -hmm. and not just to say that, but to understand it, right? So Kelly Fasane wrote a really interesting profile about this guy Michael Anton, who at that time, when he wrote about him, was uh, uh, anonymous. He, he he wouldn't give his real name, but he was this strange creature in in the Trump universe, which is to say a Trump intelligentsia. The, the lack of a Trump intelligence is quite interesting, but I think we're duty bound to write about that too, and not s just and not sneeringly, but with some penetration and 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 the same thing we would owe to a profile of um, uh, all the people you mentioned. Thank you. All right. I can't say it's in ascendance. Um, last question. Yeah, last question. I gotta. Hello. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could talk briefly about which aspects of the New Yorker you think might be underappreciated or not noticed by um, readers or the general audience? That's nice. <laughs> That's such a lovely question. <laughs> well, I, I, the New Yorker is not the New Yorker if it's not in any given week f funny. And I, I, I have to say that Getting things that are authentically funny, not just a kind of gag or just a cheap line about Donald Trump, who offers them up on an hourly basis, but something that's lastingly funny is, is every bit as difficult to get as something that's lastingly um, of great value in terms of nonfiction or, or fiction. And it shouldn't be underestimated. You know, I, the you know, whether it's Roz Chast or a new cartoonist like Ed Steed or Liana Fink or, um, or somebody who's, who's really a, a great humorist like Ian Frazier, that's really hard to come by. And when it does happen, um, uh, or Anthony Lane is, is essentially a critic, critic humorist in many ways, uh, I think sometimes that's underestimated because in hot take world, it's, you know, what does the New Yorker have this week that I can use politically, or, you know, what's the, what's the takeaway from this 10,000 word piece? I mean, that's kind of leaves the humor part in the dust in a way that I, you know, now I'm gonna weep about. No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the question, I, and, I, and I guess that's probably one of the ways to answer it. Or, or Barry Blitz covers. 
I think are lastingly funny. So. Wonderful. That was great. David thank Ramnick, you. thank you so much. Thank you.